With me now, I have Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director in Office Enough, as well as Dr. Namika Ubiariri, a Certified Financial Engineer and Investment Banking Executive. Happy Easter uh, to both of you. Uh, very quickly, we have two guests, uh, John Cardinal Nayeka, uh, Archbishop Emeritus of the Catholic Church, and uh, Senator Jimo Ibrahim, the Senate Committee Chairman on uh, the Interparliamentary uh, Committee, who touch on subjects from economy to politics uh, to governance. And incidentally, he's from the same state, which uh, Yemi Adam uh, And he says he would like to be your next governor. Indeed. Yes, so uh, first, let me start with you, Yemi Adam Olekun. Well, let's start with Easter and the Archbishop. Always a pleasure to, to listen to him. And I think, I mean, the point, I think he made, the, I, I was trying, to, I'll paraphrase anyway, that turning or rolling away the stone yes. is about righteous living, not about holy noise. And I think you had talked about the fact that in every street corner we'll have houses of religious worship. If Nigeria is, if Ni Nigeria's development can be judged by the number of houses of religious worship we have, Nigeria will probably be the most developed country in the world, bar none. But obviously we see that that's not the case. And, and I think that really is, is an indictment and an interesting reflection for the season. Muslims are fasting, we're celebrating Easter, and the, both, the tenets of both faith speak to righteous living. And I think if we look at where we are as a country, it's, it's really, I don't even know how, know how else to say, but it's as if we really don't care. But we just, we'll go to church, we'll go to mosque, and everybody keeps it moving as if that's, that's what is really important. And secondly, he spoke about Hajj and talked about his 80th birthday. And I think not only, I mean, we've, we've, it's come up more and more. I would have thought that given the economic situation of the country, that this season is a perfect time for the federal government to say that we will not be subsidizing all state governments. In Kano State, for example, is the state governor that he's saying he'll give everybody going half a million naira to subsidize. I'm like, in the grand scheme of what we need to spend money on, if you want to go and pray, feel free to go. Why is it the government's responsibility? And yet we say we're a secular state. So in one vein, we say we're a secular state. In another vein, we continue to mix the church, quote unquote, and the state, and we wonder where we have problems. I'm not even quite sure. Maybe we should actually sue. I wonder if we, maybe. You know, because if technically, if we say we're a secular state, nobody should be spending state money yeah. to subsidize religious expedition. Mm, that's a thought. And then to the gentleman who wants to be governor of my state. I mean, he spent a lot of time saying a lot, but I honestly didn't really quite get any, anything out of what he said. But I will say two things. He spoke a lot about borrowing money, that Nigeria needs to borrow money, and then paralleled it to Dubai, through shade at Dubai that they were here a few years ago borrowing money from us. And I'm like, well, but if you go to Dubai, you can see what they spent the money on. We borrow money, but we can't really see where it's going. So borrowing as a principle is not the problem. It's the fact that we borrow without the discipline to go with it. And Mr. Ibrahim does have a few things to say about borrowing money and not paying back. But I'll leave that to my colleague. Yes, Dr. Um, Bell. Very interesting discussions. Um, 90 billion naira used to subsidize um, Hatch. It's a country will be rolling down the road. They can or 50 billion naira loan for students. 50 billion naira for 6 million indigent children in tertiary institution. We are still debating on it, but we are squandering 90 billion to subsidize Hajj, Hajj of the privileged 1% Nigeria, because the one or three million extreme poor Nigerians are not going to be going to Hajj. The over 197 million Nigerians that live under poverty are not going to go to Hajj. It's the same privileged elites that we are squandering money on. The 90 billion that we are going to be wasting subsidizing has will have given us 7,500 greenhouse farms. 7,500 greenhouse farms that will have been giving us 22 million naira revenue annually over the next 15 years. will have created nothing less than 15,000 jobs with that amount of money. That is for that. Then on the issue of um, Nigeria borrowing money, <laughs> we need to understand that currently we have Total national debt profile of war and seven trillion naira. It was twelve trillion naira June 30, 2015, $10 billion external reserve, external debt. As of today, we have $43 billion external debt. External debt that we're even coping to service. And we are hemorrhaging. I am not against borrowing. You know, some of us we always cite debt to GDP. 
think uh, Japan has debt to the GDP of over 250 percent. But Japan is a developed economy. Japan has revenue that will enable them to pay up their debt in two years. South Africa has a massive debt of almost about $78 billion um, um, external debt. But South Africa generates almost $126 billion annually. If South Africa wants to pay off the external debt, they can do it within one year. Nigeria cannot pay off our external debt within one year based on the circumstances here. And somebody should not be... Go to Amcon and look at the list of those who are owing Nigeria. 20 people are owing 65% of the 5 trillion naira that was used to bail them out with Amcon. And uh, we should be very, very Mr. careful. One of, well, of course, we should be very careful how we talk about borrowing. If we borrow on inf for infrastructure, the 23 tri trillion naira that was printed and the shared, which is creating the problem we have today, which Yemi Kados is trying to mop up through all manner of monetary policy instruments. If that 23 trillion naira had been invested in agriculture, we would have created 2 million jobs and would have been generating nothing less than 33 trillion naira annually to this economy. If we had applied those funds on productive purposes, if we want to, but I'll give you an example now. I tell them the most lucrative rail route in Nigeria, which is an infrastructure that is very, very key to our economic development, Lagos, Shagamu, Ijebo, De Ore, uh, 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 Asaba, uh, uh, Benin, Asaba, Onecha, Owere, Potako, Sekobak, uh, Umaya, Aba, Okigwe, Oka, Onecha. That is about 1,085 kilometer that will take about 6.5 billion dollars to fix under a ppp framework we've done the numbers that traffic alone has about 200 um, billion uh, 200 million tons of cargo traffic every year it has about 500 million passenger traffic that route if we borrow 6.5 trillion a uh, billion do it under ppp will unlock on an annual basis over two billion dollars into this economy in fact that loan will be paid over seven years basically what we have been doing over the last um, 24 years, especially over the last nine years, is borrow to consume. And it does not make sense. We must tie borrowing to critical infrastructure development. If we decide to borrow today to tie it to those critical infrastructure, i give you an example. They are planning to go and borrow a $1.1 billion to import 10,000 mm -hmm. tractors. I, I have an arrangement with a Chinese company. I, I will give you the details. The Chinese companies are willing to come to Nigeria to set up a plant and that plant they are willing to even use to supply us both tractor and bulldozer for 82 million for a two thousand dollars and that will help us develop about 15 million hectares of new farm up, up, up gates so these are the kind of thing we must be very careful of how we allow those in the public sector to just borrow and squander we must tie it to projects and well, it must be I done get, under private public partnership arrangements i you get your do. point about borrow yes before you go on and to your point you were saying that he had been fact checked against his um claim about abandoned projects. And you were right. And the, the document basically said by the Chartered Institute of Project Managers of Nigeria and the Nigerian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, they say there are over 50,000 abandoned projects, or so even a lot more. But what he did say as a caveat was he said major projects. So maybe the discrepancy is in what you consider the size of the project, the project. that was abandoned. Okay, but, but uh, Dr. Biari, I mean, I get this point about borrowing and all that. That's what we all say. The Nigerian government borrows for consumption rather than for productivity. productivity. And he was making the point that his argument is that you can borrow, yeah. but borrow for development, exactly. not for consumption. For projects, yeah. He was very clear on that. Yes. Yeah. But I wanted you to comment on this bank recapitalization mm. that may lead to the disappearance of some banks or mergers and acquisitions. Dr. Bati, I've <laughs> always insisted Nigeria does not need recapitalization of banks. What Nigeria needs is financial inclusion trying to get the huge informal sector into the formal sector. Mm. The role of banks is financial intermediation. What the primary responsibility of banks is to bridge the gap between surplus economic unit and deficit economic unit. I have traveled all over the world. I have had education both in the UK and America. And in all my lives, my days outside Nigeria, I've never seen where people, banks, are forced to capitalize, to social. If, assuming, okay, the banks capitalize. Assuming the whole banks now capitalized to even 500 billion, the highest we can attract into this economy, assuming we are having foreign direct investors, it's about $4 billion. Dr. Bati, this country requires critical at least $100 billion investment annually over the next 30 years to enable us to get to the level of the second world economy. We have developed under Obasanjo a global infrastructure development master plan that requires us to have at least invest $3 trillion over the next 30 years. And it's not asking banks to recapture. I'll give you an example. Go to America, go to South Africa, go to UK. 
In last year alone, the transaction, volume of transaction that passed through the in, in NIPS was about 600 trillion naira. Volume of transaction that happened in this economy was over 10,000 trillion naira. The bank shareholders fund cannot take anything. What does bank do? I'll give you an example. If Dr. Barton wants to stop a cement factory, and is like Dr. Jimmy Ibrahim talked about a bitumen, which is very huge in those states. Assuming we have a company that wants to be a bitumen processing plant that will take about $10 billion. You don't expect banks to fund what normally in the developed economy that such a company will set up a special purpose vehicle, do his business plan for the business studies, raise CPs. And that CPs is if he goes to the capital market, they can do bonds. If he decides to go to the banks, the banks. Yes. If they decide to go to the banks, the banks will they will raise the commercial paper, five year commercial paper, ten year commercial paper. What the banks will do now is to provide what they call bankers' guarantees. And it becomes a BA. What the banks do, banks underwrite it and provide bankers' guarantee. And the man goes out there, pitches investments, and the people will subscribe, both global and local investors. This idea of forcing banks to recapitalize, and moreover, if you look at it, the top five big banks are already, they have shareholders' fund in excess of a trillion dollar. I looked at the balance sheet of GTB. 935 billion, as of 2022. Assets Bank, 1.3 trillion, as of 2022. And they just declare 730 billion naira profit. Mm -hmm. Zeni Bank, 1.3. Asking them to do 500 billion naira. Their shareholders' fund is already... Let me explain to you. Shareholders' fund is not part of it. I will explain the to CBN you. The CBN shareholders' fund will not be... Dr. Abati, they are, they, let me tell you what they will do. It's very simple. Dr. Abati, you have 100 million naira. 50 million is in your bedroom. 2 million is in Zeni Bank. The rest is in GT Bank. Somebody says you want to buy a car. And you tell somebody, I'm going to transfer social amount from GT. The person says, no, 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 no. You can't transfer from GT. You will only pay with the one in Zenit. It doesn't make sense. What these banks, <laughs> what these banks will do? By next year, they will do 80% dividend payout. To their shout, you can't stop them from paying out their money. And then they will issue new shares and they will subscribe back. Well, one of the options <laughs> that the CBN is, uh, you know, uh, recommending to them is the issuance issue of shares, IPO. Then I watch it Dr. Somewhere. Bati, they will do it, but I'm just telling, you how, I'm telling you how they will, how they will fund it. You cannot stop a man that has money not to use his money. What they will do is to do the huge dividend payouts. They will offer, Dr. Bati, if you're a shareholder in a bank, you have 20 million shares and they pay you dividend and they're issuing new shares. You will, after the bank paid you well, you will subscribe. Trying to tell a bank that has shareholders fund, equity, net equity of two trillion. Okay, who will who will bring in money? Okay. Assuming we even I know what they're trying to do to Tabati. They are trying to see if they can bring in more foreign investors that will bring in more foreign inflow. Dr. Tabati, we have an economy that needs at least fifty billion dollars foreign direct investment. We have a country that can do at least thirty to fifty billion foreign diaspora remittances on annual basis. We need to fix the structural, constitutional, and physical deformities, fix the insecurity, fix the oil theft to allow more dollar inflow. These things they are doing just tickling the surface. But even beyond that, it will solve the problems. Yeah, but also beyond that, in terms of just banking generally, given what happened last year and people being in a sense scared of putting their money in bank, we haven't done anything to yes. increase people's trust Confidence, in banking. Yeah. And then also you penalize me. So we're saying we want people to keep our money in the banks, use electronic transact electronic channels. You charge me every time I get money in, every time I transfer money out. So how does that endanger people and not endanger, but and yeah, engender people to trust in the system? That okay, if it's if I transfer money to you and I don't get charged for it, I'll more likely do it more often. But the more I transfer, the more I get paid. Like so someone who has less money to play around with and they get charged every time they do a transaction, they'd rather not do it. So trust in the banking system that can I get more people from the informal um, sector to come into the formal sector. We're not spending time on that, but we're just spending more time in, in just making things a bit more difficult. This is the only country where you see people go about looking for deposits. Dr. Bat <laughs> even our Greek in the US, how do they fund that Greek? Okay. If we are rice farmers, we put ourselves into cooperatives, okay. we raise CPs, government gives guarantee, people subscribe and we repay. Well, let's go to Senegal, where there's going to be, you know, the inauguration ceremony for a new president on Tuesday. 44-year-old Senegalese opposition presidential candidate, Basiru Diomaye Faye, is set to become president. Faye, who had since addressed his first press conference, will now be the youngest president, elected president in the history of Senegal, and in fact, in the history of Africa, the youngest elected uh, African president at this moment. While official results of Sunday's vote were not yet available, the former prime minister was the other front runner and who was backed by 
incumbent President Macky Sall considered defeat based on preliminary results. Sall followed with congratulations, also naming Faye as a winner. Faye's victory reflected frustration among youths, many of whom have been largely unemployed with concerns about governance in the West African nation. The results showed Faye with about 53.7% and Amaduba from the current ruling coalition with 36.2%. Uh, percent. Meanwhile, Senegal's Constitutional Council has confirmed Faye's presidential election victory. The confirmation paves the way for his inauguration as the country's fifth president, which is expected to take place on April 2. The top court validated provisional results announced earlier on Wednesday based on vote tallies from 100% of polling stations. Faye, who is described as an anti-establishment candidate and an ally of popular opposition figure Usmane Sonko, won more than 54% of votes cast in the election. And his victory came just 10 days after he was freed from prison. So now we have uh, this development in Senegal. Macky Sall could not extend his tenure. Macky Sall could not uh, postpone the election. The Constitutional Court helped to save democracy. And the people, as we were saying yesterday, uh, last week, voted for change. And here you have this former tax collector, mm -hmm. you know, now imagine as president, 10 days after he was released from prison. Now, some people have said there are lessons we can learn mm -hmm. from Senegal. What are those lessons? Yeah, I mean, let me start with you again. I mean, a, a, a very basic one is that when people believe that something is worth fighting for and worth protecting, they give it what they give it what it takes. The Yorubas say that basically you give it what, what it requires. No, but it's true. And I think if you look at how Senegal got here, it wasn't overnight and it wasn't a, a fluke. It started, as you rightly said, with Macky Sall trying to ex do an Obasanjo with a third term. And they were very vehemently... Obasanjo didn't do a third term. No, no, he tried. Well, he tried to get a third term. That's why I said Macky Sall tried to do what Obasanjo wanted to do. I, I stand by that. Um, but he was unable, and citizens pushed back. And now, not only did they push back, they continued and they maintained the momentum. It is said that school teachers will tell parents, come and pick up your children at 2 o'clock, because we plan to join the, close down school to join the, the, pro, the protest, so to speak. And so I think the lesson there is that Senegalese people thought their democracy was that important enough to protect, and they were not going to allow neither Macky Sall to get a third term, nor to get him to just, on a whim, postpone the date of the elections. Now, we also see what we have in Nigeria with our legislative arm, literally rubber stamp. They silenced the opposition people in the, in, in the assembly, in the parliament, and they went ahead to, to, to agree, in a sense, with Macky Sall. But the Constitutional Court came and said, no, this is a violation of our constitution. You can't do that. We must have elections, and they set a date. So it was successful in moving the date a bit forward, but it wasn't successful in postponing it, in a sense, ad infinitum. Again, something to be said for the judiciary, I would say, in Senegal, but just basically standing by, by the law and following, and following the law. And then lastly, on election day, um, Sanko wasn't allowed to run. He backed a younger, a, a younger candidate who was, who was, in a sense, also opposition, winning the election on his birthday. Again, people came out to vote. So there's one thing to say you don't want something or you are against something. But in a sense, I'd say, I mean, 54% again, I think that's also important to note that he didn't also win by a landslide. So it's not in, uh, the narrative that the whole country was against Sal and his party. But people did believe enough in it to come out and vote and, and give him the winner. But having said that, I think the biggest thing, though, is for him to realize that campaigning and opposition is very, very different from governing. And I hope he surrounds himself with the right people and sort of makes critical decisions very early so he gets the support that he needs, not having been in government or being participated in the actual process of running a country. But there's something to be said for Youngest only, not only in Senegal, but for the country and high expectations for him. Well, in terms of what he wants to do, just the point that uh, Yemi was making about governance. He wants to uh, abandon the uh, CFA, <laughs> you know, do away with that... Uh, yeah colonial heritage. 
He wants to review contracts, mining contracts especially. He wants to create jobs. He wants to combat uh, corruption, I guess, as a former tax uh, inspector. Yeah. So the, at this to a point that now it's time to govern. And yeah. then he has, uh, he has uh, Sonko, Usman Sonko, uh, who would have been the candidate if he was yeah. not jailed. And then, you know, Sonko has been going about with him. I hope we're not going to have issues <laughs> of, of two presidents or, mm. you know, godfather and godson. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor. I, I, I think um, Senegalese got what they wanted. They fought for it. And it's victory for democracy. Um, 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 Sally wanted to play games. I never worked out. And lessons are there for us in Nigeria. You know, I've always said this thing. Um, if a majority of us are upright, we'll do the right things. Democracy will work here. You know, we seem to be saying to everybody, oh, Mahmoud Yakubu promised us this. It never happened. We, elections were conducted in 176,000 polling booths. There were four electoral staff in those polling booths, mostly youth coppers. We had 8,809 ward collection centers and uh, of safe staff. Then we had 774 local government electoral officers. If every one of them stood for what is right in all the elections, resist any inducement. We don't need all. No, no, just if even <laughs> half of them, we won't be where we are today. Look at Abia State, the kind of thing they're enjoying, dividends of democracy. A woman, vice chancellor of uh, private University of technology, over there, Professor Nenoti, they call her Akwa Akuro, stood her ground. If that woman had bent like others, today Abia State would have stayed continue with the same 24 years of misery. Go and see the pensioners. They are receiving the fact there was a particular man I was watching since 1991. He got 1.4 million naira. His pensions are his pension that we are long overdue. The man had painstakingly, scientifically cut out. There is no governor in Nigeria. I say Dr. Bati, that cannot pay salary. There's no governor in Nigeria that cannot independently raise enough revenue within their country, outside Fak and Jack, if they decide to do what is right. Cut this. You know, there's this penchant for us to always look at Abuja. Look inward. There is no governor in Nigeria today if they can cut the stealing, the looting, the inefficiencies that cannot pay good minimum wage and still develop their economy outside the FAC and Jack allocation. Victory for democracy in Senegal is a lesson for every one of us. We must all look inward. Look at the man in the mirror. Each and every one of us is not a victim. We are not a victim. We are collectively, we are collective accomplices because if I decide to do right, four young men in, in Babylon decided they will not be part of the, 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 the game. At the end of the day, Nebuchadnezzar bowed, and the right things were done. The chief scribes, the professors, the big men all bowed, but the four young men refused to bow. If we can get young men like Daniel, Shadrach, Mishak Adaba in Nigeria today, we will repeat what happened in Senegal. Okay. A sermon on Easter Sunday. I love it. I love it. I love <laughs> let's, it. Let's take our final topic <laughs> on this edition. Nigeria's defense headquarters has declared eight persons wanted over their roles. In the recent killing of 17 military personnel in Delta State, the military released the list last Thursday at a briefing in Abuja. On March 14, 2024, officers and soldiers of the 181 Amphibious Battalion were killed by some angry youths during a peacekeeping mission in the Okwama community. The military has been combing the creeks in the community and other areas in search of the perpetrators of the crime. Well, what we know, is that uh, the uh, Ovier of uh, Ewu Kingdom, uh, who was one of the persons on that list of wanted persons, has uh, since uh, you know, reported to the police uh, to say he knows nothing about it. Some others have not shown up, but there is also the other angle where Femi Falano essay and has said the uh, defense headquarters is doing police work. Mm -hmm. That is the duty of the police to arrest, to interrogate, and to prosecute and that the defense uh, headquarters could bungle their own case by insisting on uh, declaring people wanted, even when they do not have powers under civil law to do that, because these are not uh, military persons. They, what they have is uh, martial law, and this is not, you can't cut martial, you know, uh, civilians. So, Dr. Biari, briefly, as we wrap up. Dr. Bati, what is happening in Okwama and Nairata? It's the same problem that we have been having in Nigeria, impunity on uh, non-state actors. For non-state actors to take gun and kill four top officers, a lieutenant colonel, a major and captain, shows you the kind of rot we have in Nigeria. And of course, I read in the papers, one of the, uh, some of some people were saying, some unknown faceless guy that were saying, if they don't do this, this, that, the oil bunkering will continue. From June to December this year, premium time report shows that we have lost over $10 billion 
what of crude oil. If you look deep beyond all these things, you will see there may be oil behind it. Dr. Bati, we have made the commendations. I said we need to unbundle the current security architecture of Nigeria. We have made suggestions. The current army is overstretched. Police is overstretched. Dr. Bati, think about it. Every community knows those who are the criminal, the good, mm -hmm. and the bad. And as long as you have gone in the hand of few bad men, they will subdue the majority who wants to live right. Okwama is deserted. I can tell you 90 percent of those who live in Okwama may not even know what happened. But few men had brought opprobrium to them. What do we do? 8,809 electoral ward. Select 100 youths. Let the communities contribute. We can enroll them into the army. They can be called special military infantry men, whatever, under the military high command. Train them. Equip them. Give them AK-49. In every local government area, provide them with armored personnel carriers. For those in river and areas, provide them with armored amphibian um, um, vessels. Dr. Party, give them responsibility. Their job is protect the oil asset. For those in the agri-beds, protect their community. Let me tell you what will happen. These guys have the incentive. They have the filial connections. They are under military high command. They are not unknown government or people who are state actors. They are not under the governors. Dr. Party, they will fish out this kind of arrangement in six months. They will fish out all the criminals within their localities. It is one thing. But Pastor Enoch Adewe says something. If you come into a community, there are five people. Four of them have AK-47. They are righteous men. The only criminal among them will either leave town or he will repent. But if you come into that community, four of them are armed robbers. Only one is a righteous man. And they all have AK-47. It's either he becomes a criminal or they will liquidate him. Under this arrangement... Hundred youths in every of the autonomous, uh, in every of the wars, we will have new eight hundred thousand youths in the army. You will train them, equip them, post them back to their communities under the sure instruction of the military high command. Fish out the criminals. Well, we, have, we have anti task security. Doctor Abati, I am giving. No, 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 I'm giving you. Forget the task force. And you'll be cheaper than the people who are Doctor Abati, we will pay them one fifty thousand every. I will tell you. We have done arrangement on how it can be funded. Very easy. It will you, not be cheaper than four billion. Very people. cheaper, Doctor Abati. Let me let me even explain to you what will happen. You will give them life insurance, twenty billion, twenty million each of them. You will give Doctor Abati. Let me tell you what will happen. These guys, I come from a committee today that is deserted because of unknown government. If you do a sample survey, 95% of my people are so distressed. They are distressed because we have very few rascals and miscreants who have AK-47. If you have in a local government area 1,000 youths with four AK-47 uh, AK and four armor personnel carrier, Dr. Abati, anyway, Nigeria will become paradise in six months. We, we need to wrap up now. Uh, Yemi, do you subscribe to this? Uh, because the youths that have uh, guns in the north, they are using the guns to kidnap people. But they are, no, 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 no. But, they guns, but his, his difference is the fact that they, okay. they're not guns that they got on their own. They're, in a sense, licensed guns because they're under a structure. Oh, All I do agree with, science and, and, and research has shown that when people are invested because it's their community and they are empowered to protect what is theirs, yes. they will protect. Because yes. it's theirs. Yes. Because people cannot farm. People are living where, I mean, I mean, the issues are plenty and it's exactly. their own assets. And I think the fact that, because if you look at it as well, we are empowering one human being whose name is government, by the way, and paying him a monthly sum of money to protect assets that he's not protecting. And what is his own stake in it? And he's just saying, you know what, rather, and the point is we have a lot of young people that are not doing anything. And so if you don't give people a purpose or a cause, yeah. as if, since today is someone Sunday yes. on this show, Bible says, is there not a cause? Is if there's a cause for them that you empower them to take ownership of and run with, I think it can work. I haven't done the numbers as he has or the structure, but I think, I mean, the fundamental principle of empowering people to protect what is their own, yeah. they will take ownership of it. Well, there is one, uh, there's one senator, at least, who is saying, let the local, all of us carry guns. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if we are all armed, armed. then nobody <laughs> would uh, kidnap anybody or steal. Uh, crude oil. Anyway, thank you very much. Yemi Adamaloku. Thank you very much, Dr. Namika Obiaruri. Thank you. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching.